Okay, we are now complete with the workup uh, to get your cases ready. Now, I will say that in courses that I teach, I tend to recommend that all of that work be done by an auxiliary, an assistant, someone else that can be trained to get everything set up uh, if this is done in a doctor's, in a dental office. Um, and at this point is when I suggest the provider come in and sort of um, determine where they want the teeth positioned. So, okay, at this point, I want to note, I want to comment on one big update to the software. It may seem small, but it is a big update. The, that update is the orange line on our tooth here. As I click on each tooth, this is telling where the software has determined the midline to be. I have to say, it is greatly improved from previous versions. That was a difficulty. How does the, the software estimate where the, where the, uh, uh, the center of rotation of the tooth is and everything. And we used to have to adjust those a lot. Well, at the same time as now we have this line, which makes it so much easier to adjust. Well, the software is also doing a, a significantly better job of estimating. You can see it kind of moving all around, but it's figuring out based on the tooth alignment and where it needs to be. So let's pretend this one's not quite right. It's actually pretty close, but let's pretend it's not. If I look at this orange line, I want to straighten it out. I can click on over, come over here to refine midline. Notice that this globe, this alignment sphere or pivot, whatever you want to call it, we'll call it the alignment sphere uh, or the, sorry, the alignment widget. The alignment widget will sort of change color and turn darker. And the line goes from orange to yellow. We can now move this without moving the tooth. I trip it back and then I slide it back. And now I think, okay, well, that's the middle of the tooth. I unclick this. Whenever it's bright like this, if I move it, the whole tooth moves with it. Okay? Remember, our Control Z or Undo button will always put the tooth back in case we make an adjustment we don't like. Okay, so that is the refined midline. I know I've jumped ahead a little bit by coming all the way down here, but I thought it was important to discuss it at the moment because we could see that orange line, and I want you guys to know that that's available to you. It really helps to visualize. We used to have to adjust just the pivot without really being able to see where it came through the tooth. The line makes it much more obvious. Okay, so now I'm going to walk you through what all the buttons over here do. First, Show Opposing Arch. Click on this and the Opposing Arch hides. If I click on Collisions, it's going to show me basically the occlusal contacts. Light contacts throughout the arch. This is based on a digital scan, a pretty old one. This is a few years old, but it's the one I use for all my videos because I like to have consistency of the videos. Well, anyway, so that's this is a, in her natural state. This is where she has um, occlusion. So in our final, we're going to want to have similar, similarly red markings, okay? Now, um, yeah, so I'm going to turn that off because I don't want it constantly calculating. It can slow things down a little bit, so I turn that off for now. If I move a tooth, let's just, for fun, let's move this tooth, and you'll see that these numbers start popping up. Notice that if you've used the old version of software, it would tell you to the 100th how much IPR was going to be needed. That's what this is telling us. It's telling us how much contact there is with the tooth. Now it rounds it to five hundredths, and it always rounds down. It rounds down because we would rather clinically that we have a little bit of interference than to round up and accidentally over open up a contact. If you're going to do IPR, you do not want to overdo it and leave the patient with a diastema. We never want to remove more than we have to. And then we had to make a decision, and I would rather you accidentally have too much contact, slow down movement, than to open up contacts and then end up with diastemas and, yeah, you've overtreated at that point. Also, if I tip this forward, you'll notice that the number gets blue on one side and starts getting really big and it's actively changing. That is a diastema being calculated, whereas this is the IPR contact. We can turn either one of them off anytime we want. If we don't want to see them, if they become distracting as we're aligning teeth, and I just don't want to see that simple enough. Okay? I'm going to come back to the curve in just a minute. It's a big concept, so I'm going to skip snap the curve for just a minute. 
right here we have lock tooth. We need to, we have the ability to lock a tooth so that as we, if we don't want to move it, we can lock it so that no matter what we do, this tooth is locked. Its position cannot be adjusted. More, it's even easier to simply right click on a tooth. And you can lock as many teeth as you want. Okay? You can also unlock them by right clicking. Just make sure you hold the mouse still. If you're moving at all, it won't understand that you're trying to do that. Okay, so we've locked it. You can also unlock all the teeth real quickly. Now, I will say from a, um, a philosophical a philosophy perspective of ortho alignment and clear liners, I will typically lock at least one tooth on either side. I will consider that my anchor tooth. Everything's going to move relative to that tooth. Can we truly get expansion of all the teeth in the arch um, with a clear liner, a piece of plastic? That's debatable. So I generally, the second molars quite often, I'm not going to move those and everything else will move relative to them. There are times when that's tipped into the lingual or the buckle and actually you need to use the first molar as the anchor, but that's the exception, not the rule. Most often it's the second molars for me. But again, that's up to you and how you want to set up cases. So I have locked those teeth. Now I can also say, let's click on this tooth right here that I moved earlier. Notice I can now reset the tooth back to where it was. And if I didn't mean to reset it, I can undo and it's back to where it was. If I have moved many teeth, wherever I want, I can reset all teeth. They're back to where they were. Okay? All right. So one more thing. Let's undo that where all these teeth have been moved. And I skipped over a box right here, which was initial position. If I click on it now, I can see this. the dark gray is where the teeth were. Okay, so it's a good comparison for me to see where, where, where we started and where we are now. I'm going to turn that off. Now I'm going to go back up to snap to curve because it's a big concept and I wanted to get you familiar with some of the smaller concepts first. So let's go ahead and reset all teeth. Now this blue line is, represents the dental curve, the curve of the arch. The software has to estimate it to begin with, but we have the ability to manipulate it. Keep in mind, in this version of the software, there are one, two, three, right back here, four, five, it's hidden inside this canine right now, six, there's one hidden right here, and seven. There are seven nodes. If you can't see it, just drag your mouse across the blue line, and your mouse will suddenly turn and do a finger. There's one, there's one, there's one, and obviously the ones you can see. Okay, so we can now stretch this out a little bit to whatever we think the arch should look like when this patient is aligned properly. Now, to keep things symmetric, my suggestion is that you keep the anterior posterior portion, you know, dimension or position of these somewhat relatively consistent. Notice that I'm just on the distal edge of this second premolar, distal edge. Okay. Canines, if you want a more broad smile, you can bring these forward, but make sure you bring them forward the same amount. Okay. And then this is obviously the very front. Once I have that position to where I want, I can click on, I can snap one tooth to the curve, moves it out there. Let's reset all teeth. Or I can snap all teeth, and they will all go out there. When I press on the IPR button, it turns it back on. Notice that all the IPR values are the exact same. Okay? It's going to try to approximate all of them the same within about five tenths. Sometimes you might have one that's 0.15, uh, um, but other than that, it's all going to be almost the same. If we look at the case, there's a couple things we can do if we want to change this. Say we didn't want to do any IPR at all. We could move each of the nodes out a little bit to increase the size. But I'll tell you one way to, I, would, I hate to use the word cheat, but in a sense, cheat that. A way to do it a little bit quicker is in fact to raise or lower the curve. Okay? 
If you do it too much, you can just hit undo. If you want to increase the IPR, you want to really constrict them back a little bit because you, you for whatever reason, you know you want to do that, bring it down incisally, okay? What'll happen is it's trying to line all the teeth up with this. And since all of the teeth center rotations are slightly lingual to the line, if I hit snap all teeth, it shrinks them all back. Bring, consolidates them to 0.2 millimeters. In the opposite case, let's say you don't want to do any IPR, you might go a little bit high with it, above the incisal edge, now hit snap all teeth. Now you've got zero IPR. In fact, you probably have some diastemas, well, no, nothing, nothing, tr nothing really large, but, and you can kind of balance it to wherever you like it to be. I like to start with one arch before proceeding to the next. But right now, in my opinion, this has zero IPR. It says right there, but truth be told, the, the plastic will flex, and I think we'll have good, you know, uh, adjacent contacts and whatever. If you ever notice a small space like this, it's not registering as a diastema, but it almost looks open, trust that it will be in contact. That is a, I, would, I also wanna, almost want to call it an artifact, but it's just a reality of digital models, and what they have to do is separate teeth without knowing what the proximal surface actually is, because when we take a scan, it can't, our scans don't show that surface. So you're always going to see these tiny little spaces. That's okay. Just know that the software is not measuring contact. You should be good. Okay. So we've finished this. You can always say, okay, well, where did I start? Well, click right here. That's how much this case has been expanded. Now, when I say expanded, I mean tipping. The software is not going to translate teeth outward. It's going to tip them outward. Okay. That's very important because if it tries to expand laterally translate, it's going to be very hard to accomplish that in the liners. There are times quite often when that's preferable, but we are talking about a liner software right now and aligner mechanics. And most of the mechanics involved are an expansion or dental alveolar expansion, meaning the alveolus, the ridge, is going to tip outward as opposed to the actual palate expanding. Okay. Again, I don't want to get you too much in the weeds as far as um, how to design cases, whatnot, or how, how cases uh, ortho works. This is just from a software perspective. Understand that in the snap to curve functionality, it's going to tip the teeth. If you want to then push the tooth this way and this way, that's up to you. It's not something I advocate because I believe it's very difficult movements to accomplish in aligners, but again, that is up to you. Okay, so now we've got the upper planned. I'm gonna go down to the mandible. So since we've already designed where we want the upper, we really just need to set the mandible to fit it. Once again, I'm gonna lock the second molars. Now I can turn on the opposing arch and I can try to set the curve to lie right underneath it. It can be a little difficult to see it like this. So it is helpful to come down here to this little part right here. It says jaw transparency and set the jaw pretty much invisible. Now I can move these nodes out so that they're right underneath the central grooves just lingual to the anterior and try to match it up as best as I can. I try not to move these most distal nodes because I'm not moving the second molar. Um, there are times when I will, but we'll just not this time. And now I'm going to turn the teeth back visible so I can see what happens. And I'm going to click snap all teeth. All right, and I'm gonna click show opposing, so that's hidden. And I've got no IPR noted. Everything's lined up pretty well. And I'm, I'm feeling like, okay, I'm all set. Now, it is important that we assess the, uh, the opposing and how the occlusion is gonna fit. I'm pretty happy about the posterior, but I would say that there's a little more extra space in the anterior. Again, this is another one of those uh, philosophical decisions or how you approach the case because technically we've got no, I, I don't want to create a bunch of diastemas by flaring these teeth out so they have contact, 
But my other, only other option is to do a bunch of IP on the top to restrict it back. Again, you decide what you want to do, but I'll show you that what we can do, we could either lower the whole curve, snap all teeth, and that'll tighten things up. If we do that, that's fine, but it also affects the posterior. If I feel like, okay, well that looks better in the posterior, but I'm not so happy with the anterior, I still wanna pull that back a little bit, you can do that by moving these nodes. I'm gonna leave that as is, okay, for this case. The last thing we need to check though, is we do need to check for the incisal gingival position of the teeth. If I want to extrude, this tooth to he to wherever, this tooth to here or whatever, you just pull it down. It will affect the IPR values potentially. We went from now we've got zero here and 0.15. So I might just go ahead and tip this tooth back a little bit. And there I'm probably gonna be happy right there. But we do, ad we do address the incisal gingival after we've positioned them around the arch. These teeth right here, could probably be intruded to get them down to or below the level of the canines. Again, that's a, you know, depends on what your goals for the ortho are. Turn off the IPR so I can see a little better. And if you think, well, you know what, I want to turn off this curve because that's distracting, that's fine. Turn off the show curve. And if you don't like the uh, rotation widget, the alignment widget, click on one of the locked teeth and then it disappears. I would say this looks about as well aligned as you can get. If you say this tooth, well, this looks a little rotated. Okay, we'll just rotate it how you like it. And you can finesse any tooth you want to your liking. If you're all done and you say, you know what, just hypothetically, you know, I've, I've expanded everything, but this tooth, you know, it looks a little rotated. It is. It's going to be hard to rotate in the liners, but if you want to, you can then unlock it and now rotate it to where you want. It's still going to be acting as an anchor as it rotates, so I'm okay with doing that. Um, I will just say that moving those massive roots and rotating the tooth, I think it's a little bit optimistic. Okay, So I'm going to undo that because I don't think I would do it clinically. If the patient were in braces, I would be more likely to try it. In aligners, I'm not so optimistic that I'm going to rotate those teeth. But again... That's up to you. So we've now concluded our alignment. I know that took a while. It's really should only take you about five minutes or so to align the teeth, maybe up to 10. But I'm trying to walk you through all the little nuances and hopefully I've given you some tips to look for. Again, what I'm doing from a practical sense is typically I start in the upper and I'm going to um, bring the curve to where I want it to be from a an overall um, arch form, okay? I'm gonna lock those second molars and then I'm gonna snap the curve. Now, if I want to tighten things down, I'm gonna move that, I'm gonna move that curve up and down that can tighten or loosen the contacts and then I can re-snap the curve to idealize that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and you know refine any sort of alignment. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with the lower. And the lower, I'm gonna match that curve to the upper. So I've gone over all those steps. Just be sure to rewind if you need to, to see any of those uh, repeated. The last thing we need to do though in this phase is we need to determine the movement limits, okay? All this means is the software up here in the parameters, tooth, tools, preferences, tooth movement limits, the teeth are set to move so many millimeters or so many degrees per month. You can edit any of these numbers if you feel they're not accurate. If you think teeth can move faster or slower than we have proposed, you have the ability to edit these numbers however you wish. Now, what it's doing over here is this is saying, well, okay, we're gonna give you one tray per month, or we're gonna give you two trays per month, or weekly would be four trays per month. It's not going to make your teeth move faster. It's just going to be cut. It's going to cut that treatment, that movement allowance into four trays, separate trays, or two trays, or just one tray. So you can think of as a monthly tray as a more aggressive tray, because the first time they put that in, it's lined up all the amount of movement that's going to be accomplished in one month, and that's how 
in that one tray. It, or you can cut it into two trays to make it half as much movement per tray. Or you can say one quarter of the amount. If you want to really finesse a tooth, you might go to weekly. My d default is, is bi-weekly, and I'll just continue from there. In this portion right here, you have show uh, teeth with roots. You can actually attach a virtual root to the tooth so you can see it within the CT scan. So as you are, I mean, first we can move the root to align it well with the tooth, Clip, turn that off. And so now anytime you move the tooth, you can say, okay, well, that's where the root is within the bone. Is that good or bad? That, that goes along with that whole um, CT scan that we talked about at the very beginning, how you could overlay the CT scan. So that's what the virtual roots are for. And now we're done with this. Now we're going to continue on to the edit steps portion of the module.